about the Arab world is uh, is always not easy. I mean, it's a uh, it's a huge area, huge in population and in culture and in so many uh, geographic locations. North Africa, and the uh, Middle East, uh, uh, the Gulf, the Levant, and the, definitely there are differences across. Um, and you can look at some countries and see that they have on a, on a uh, uh, graph of 1 to 10 or on a ladder of 1 to 10 that uh, some are a little bit doing better, some are a little bit doing not, not better at all. Some are failed states, some are in, uh, in a state of chaos. Uh, everything is, is there. Uh, 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 possible uh, as you look at it, but there are trends that make that part of the world uh, uh, in, a, in many ways understood in, in a certain context. So there are trends, there are threads that one can cut through and see the region as such. And so that's what I will uh, focus on today. Uh, what is really going on in the grassroots of it? There are many similarities uh, and less maybe differences, but there are small states that have less trouble with wealth, but there are larger states which have the heaviness of so many issues uh, that are unresolved. And so size has also been uh, an issue in the, in the region. So currently, the countries of the Arab world are experiencing the most complex series of structural changes, civil wars, uh, entrenched Arab order uh, is facing one of its most difficult eras since its foundation. So there is a retreat of the Arab order that we see happening since 2011. A retreat of the regime, of the system, and there are many issues affecting that retreat. Historical grievances, unresolved, unresolved social, political, and economic issues, including the Israeli occupation of Palestine, which is a heavy burden on the region. International interventions, uh, you, you all have seen from so many different countries, including the United States. The role of oil, elites versus non-elites, stories and issues of marginalization cut across that part of the world, religion and politics, etc. But 211 was a, a founding year, was a very important year for the region as the Arab populations decided to take their fate into their hands. They had no plan, it was not organized, it was very spontaneous, it created so many waves and Several leaders had to leave office, Egypt, and in Libya. There was some action going on in Libya, intervention. But overall, that name of the Arab Spring created an opening of politics in a region that for several decades has not been practicing politics. There are some pockets, but overall, has not been practicing politics under single party rule or under a certain type of leadership in, in, in some of the monarchies that does not allow the space for politics or the space that will create leadership that can be opposition, that can create dialogue, that can uh, put a plan on, uh, on how the society and the country can move ahead, all single-minded, in a way, dictatorship. So, Having said that, the 211 was a big opportunity. True, it was spontaneous. And the, those who went to the streets didn't have a plan. Well, they were angry and they wanted to change and they thought this way it will happen. But the elites of the region misunderstood that opportunity. And as a result, dealt with it negatively. And that's where the counter revolution begins. After 2011, the entire situation changed 
to the counter revolution. And I think we are today where we are uh, in the situation that exists today to cause more of the counter revolution rather than the 211 eruptions. So it's true that the eruptions took the leaders of the Arab world by surprise, but the reaction was extremely tough, extremely not accommodating. I think the youth that went to the streets thought their message will be understood, thought that that's enough, but they were shocked. The result was totally different. So we can look at the rolling of GCC forces into Bahrain as part of the counter revolution. Bahrain has had grievances. There was accusations, accusations that this was Iran, but every report said it's not. It was more a grassroots situation. So the rolling of tanks to end that movement uh, without providing any political solution to what really in the first place ignited that situation was the beginning of what I see, the counter revolution. But it goes much deeper. Later on, the coup in Egypt and imprisonments of thousands of people. There's still about 60,000 in jail as we speak today. And then the ability to, to, there were massacres in different places. If you look at the Syrian situation from, from the beginning, it was very brutal in the way it dealt with the Syrian population that rebelled. If you look at the Egyptian one, it was equally brutal with the coup and beyond. And Rabha, hundreds who died unnecessarily. And then a, a, a new situation by which one party controls all others back to dictatorship, but not only dictatorship, a military rule that continues up until uh, today. Then came the whole idea that the Muslim Brothers is a terrorist organization. Well, I have my disagreements with the Muslim Brothers on so many points. But to say they're a terrorist organization, while they're not, complicates the situation. You can say Al-Qaeda is a terrorist organization, you can say ISIS is a terrorist organization, but cannot say that about the Muslim Brothers who have played into elections in Morocco successfully, who were able to create a, a, a good example in Tunisia and, and a rotation of power, uh, who play into the normal politics of Kuwait on so many levels. So to come and say you want to obliterate a, a, an entire trend in society, which is at least, at least 30 to 35 percent of the populations of the region. You are definitely destroying the politics and not allowing it to mature or evolve. So the counter-revolution was an attempt. So as, as it went after the Muslim Brotherhood, it also went after human rights activists, writers, uh, even singers who would sing in a political way. Uh, thinkers, philosophers, uh, uh, poets, uh, young activists, those who tweet on Twitter, even one statement can lend you a five to 10 year sentence. Uh, it became so brutal as we enter 213, 214, 15, 16, 17, 18, up until today. It continued. Jamal Khashoggi was not my friend Jamal died under, under severe uh, circumstances was not an exception. That was the rule. But the case of Jamal was the case that the world has been able to see to what really goes on under the radar in so many places. So that attempt of the counter-revolution was basically uh, uh, an attempt or the foundation of it was a strong belief by elites, governments, authorities in various governments in the countries of the region that they can not only save the order, but that they can bring it to the pre-2011 situation. And whatever is needed 
to make this happen should be done, and it is a sacrifice for the sake of stability. But things did not go that way. And that situation created a state of exception across the region. If we use a Gamban's the theoretical formula on the state of exception, a big state of exception, a state of emergency, a state of death over life. And uh, it was, it, with that counter-revolution, there was no interest in a democratic transition. Now, I'm still generalizing. I'm not saying this is the same case in every case. I mean, you all know that Lebanon has a more flexible political system, has other problems. You all know that Kuwait has a flexible system. And when everybody outlawed the Muslim Brothers, Kuwait did not. And it's continued to practice politics at some level or another. What I want to say here is that the overwhelming trend in the region was to outlaw. Morocco did not outlaw its Muslim brothers. It continued to have a form of politics. In Jordan, 50-50. There were some reforms in the beginning by the Moroccan king and by the Jordanian king, but later on, they retreated from those reforms, tried to make them empty. But that has created further frustration in the structures of the region. Uh, ISIS, for example, I mean, as I said, it's a terrorist organization. But we will not understand much if we only say it's a terrorist organization. We really need to understand that the levels of unemployment in the region are such a situation that we will keep creating an ISIS-like phenomenon. That is not only unemployment, but a sense of helplessness and marginalization to the point where the death coming from the system towards this population creates a death-like <coughs> reaction from a certain element in the opposition. And therefore, what lives is death and fire and hate. So it's important to look at the role of marginalization unemployment, uh, persecution, and the role of prisons. Because with the counter-revolution, the prisons uh, got very active. But the jail, the prison, is a place that creates the ISIS phenomenon. The, it is the place where someone like Zarqawi learned his methods and his thinking. It is the place where many of the leaders learned to do what they do through the, the jail, through the prison. Because the prisons are not, uh, it's, it's uh, torture is very open. Uh, humiliation is more, so torture, humiliation, murder, uh, people die through torture. Uh, there is no accountability to, do, to these jails, rape, etc. So when they get out, or when they escape, what do they carry in their hearts? And what ideology are they going to project to the world around them and to everywhere uh, they encounter? So uh, that's something to understand, uh, that defeating ISIS or not is not just the answer, that the answer is what kind of social, economic, political system we have uh, in the region, the Arab Justice Report a UN report that the UN decided not to publish under Dr. Rima Harab of Esqua, Beirut, uh, speaks very much of the state of injustice in the Arab world, uh, coupled with unemployment, with the capital uh, flight um, in the billions, in the hundreds of billions. Uh, injustice is a, is a huge issue <coughs> in that part of the world. It's, it's part, of, all of it, that injustice is part of the inability of citizens to influence their political system or to influence government at any level or to elect a head of state or a prime minister or to criticize their leaders or to remove them from office as many populations in the world do or aspire to. But in the Arab world, this has become very intensive. It's an issue. For people, they would want to do that, but they cannot. And they cannot because 
ultimately what has evolved in that part of the world and in the context of the counter-revolution was the police state and the security state in much of the area, in much of the region. State monopolizes everything, the economy, the people, and, and therefore people seek shelter in tribe, in sect, in religion, in groups, when institutions uh, are, uh, are very weak and cannot provide uh, justice to them. So my assumption is that no government in history or a group of governments can sustain such a monopoly or can sustain marginalization of its population and of institutions without falling victim to corruption and to extreme violations. And therefore, uh, even in the Arab societies that did not go through the main revolutions, uh, the major shock of 2011, uh, people are looking at the situation, observing, reading. That applies across the region to every place, from Jordan to Saudi Arabia from Oman to elsewhere, to Morocco. People are observing. Maybe you would like to know that. At some point in 2011, the people who demonstrated in the streets of Morocco were much larger in numbers than those that demonstrated in the streets of Tunisia. But the king was able to absorb it with reforms. But the reforms later on stopped in a certain place and, therefore, and took a couple of steps back. People can live with that. But for how long, it is not clear. That's where the pressure is in the region, boiling at so many different levels. I would say that Arabs at this junction of history miss President Nasser. Because of all the presidents, I mean, it doesn't mean they don't miss King Faisal as well, who also had a certain uh, uh, statue, a certain ability to, to do things the right way, given his times. But they also miss President Nasser because of his projection of Arab nationalism and his ability to give the Arab world a sense of dignity. So I would say we have a, a marginalized identity in Arab. We have a marginalized sense of who we are as Arabs. We feel we are wherever we are small in size compared to Turkey, compared to Iran, compared to mighty Israel and Zionism, compared to what goes on in the West Bank, we feel helpless. So that part of the identity is in you. Now, maybe you come and tell me, well, a Kuwaiti identity will feel different, but the Arab side of a Kuwaiti identity could feel as helpless. That identity, sometimes we'd say maybe the, the Arabs today are becoming like like, like the Jewish question of the 19th and, and early 20th century. Like they all have states, but they really don't have a state. They're becoming stateless. Many are on the run, have become in different countries. Unless it's a very small <coughs> country and affluent, but that doesn't account for the 450 million Arabs. I mean, Kuwait is 1.2 million, Qatar is 300,000. So that, that isn't the rule. UAE is a couple of million, three million. What about the 400 million? Where are they moving? Where are they going? And that's a big question that the world will, will deal with and the Arabs will have to deal with. So they miss Nasser and they miss his ethics. They miss the fact that when he died, he didn't have much to look back. That when he died, his sons and daughters were average citizens, and their house was the normal house that he had when he did the coup. Today, it's a different story. When someone dies, there are tens and hundreds of billions. The kids have huge businesses. We've seen that in Syria, we've seen that in Egypt, we've seen that everywhere. So there is a sense that this corruption has gone to a level that is totally out of control. 
In that context, the welfare state is falling apart. The welfare state. Because in the 1960s and 70s in particular, and 80s, there was a situation by which rich countries provided for poor countries. In the Arab system, today this is shrinking big time. Not only rich countries provided for poorer countries, but also rich countries provided better for their own citizens. What Saudi Arabia was able to do in the 1970s and the 1980s cannot be done today. Today it will have to come at some point to the population and put out some taxes and ask for certain sacrifices and yet bring about certain changes that may not be easily done and particularly if the financial situation with the oil prices at the level that we see today. But even countries like Jordan that became a welfare state in the 1970s and 80s as a result of the expansion of the public sector and employing everybody possible, particularly among the East Jordanian population, into the structures of the police and bureaucracy and security. Today, the state cannot provide any more in that context. So as that collapses, people are today moving, demonstrating, expressing anger over economic issues as well. So politics, economics, identity, there's a big mix of things that are taking place uh, in, the, in the region regarding the welfare state and the shrinking of the middle classes, not the expansion, the shrinking middle becoming lower middle, and lower middle becoming totally uh, poor and, and, and lacking in so many aspects. So the Arab world is in a state of disorder, despite some stable areas and countries. There are some small stable countries, but most of the region is sitting on a time bomb, composed of youth, who are today, I mean, it's, if you look at the youth group, between 15 and 29 only, they're about almost 30% of the population. If you look at it beyond all who are under 29, then you're over 60 in some places, and over 65, and probably 70 in other places, who are looking for freedom, dignity, but are looking for jobs, security, and a happier life. So the more time passes, the more radicalized the grassroots movements will become. The entrenched regimes lack the imagination, but also lack the political creativity. If you all, we are now in the United States of America, when this country was founded with independence, it had imagination and creativity that created a federal system and a country without a king and a republic that was able to manage its affairs and reach where it reached. Politics needs creativity. Politics needs imagination. That imagination is not there among much of the elites of the region. And therefore, uh, the deep-rooted social political problems will only increase and the only way the regimes understand so far is to use the stick, a police stick, to use the security. <coughs> but at the same time, the command-based structures and plans uh, uh, will not work easily. It's like when you say, well, there is Vision 2030, or Vision 2040, or Vision 2035. It's written with a consulting house, within a certain limit, without, without much discussion and debate at the level of society, these command-based structures or command-based visions, approaches, will simply not work. So many things will come up in the way. And these long-term policy announcements, they're not even plans, face a lot of challenges among a critical population or an increasingly a critical population. So the Arab order is back 
to the drawing board. We look at today at, at, at many of the regimes, they are stressed by the changes around them. But they prefer the security approach. Uh, today, the old order is fighting on more than one front. First, against the violent extremism, ISIS, Al Qaeda, and whoever comes later. But also a result of marginalization and social economic, not only a result of reading books, not only a result of being indoctrinated. That's a smaller part of the story. You can read the Quran a million times, you can read the Bible a million times. If you're not stressed, you're not going to react to every. You, you will see only the stressed points within what you read. So many of those young see the, the stressful side, and they will not see the turn your cheek and turn, you know, that you will see when you're a happier person. <laughs> you will turn your cheek then, you know, and if you don't do it this way, or in, in Quran, many things, you know, like, uh, you know, if, if, let people believe in what they believe, you have your own, they have their own, and uh, dialogue is the only way. But a radical is going to only see certain aspects out of context. Shoot them when you see them, kill them when you find them, go after them, etc. He will take out of the entire Quran something about a particular story in a particular situation when Muslims were encircled and when Muslims were on the defense and take it out of context. That we can do in the Bible. There are many statements about doing and making and killing and butchering out of context. So your situation determines what you take. It's not the other way around socio-economic, political, identity, the feeling. We need to see that in politics there are feelings. I mean, who in his own mind would think that Britain will have a vote and then Brexit will happen? That's the power of emotion. And that's democracy. And you, who would think, I mean, there would be a revolution in 2011 in the Arab world? Who would know? It's emotions that creates this suddenly. Nobody in the Arab world, particularly the political movements, and understood that this will happen. It just happens. There are things that happen in history it's through the power of the, 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 it's the gut feeling of an entire population in a given moment. It is a, 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 a moment of clarity under the very clear sky when it happens. It happens. It could be wrong. It could be right. So, Today, that old order is on, on, on more than one level, fighting Al-Qaeda and ISIS and, and, and the splinter groups that come with it. But also, on the second level, it is fighting fiercely against the non-violent opponents and activists who are seeking change and democratization in the region. And that's a bigger problem. That's the problem, The struggle against both has created a dynamic whereby states, are using the fight against terrorism, Al-Qaeda, etc., ISIS, to undermine the rights of peaceful activists across the region. The greater the number of activists and political opponents who land in jail for their opinions and for criticism of leaders, the greater the anger and the potential for violence and the threat to state that's a trend that you see. But it seems as well that the times have changed, that the Arab populations do realize that they have some power. They've tasted it in 2011. They realize that are, there are other sources of power outside authoritarian structures in the base of society and among its middle classes, intellectuals, and the rest of the society. It's this aspect that the populations in the region has discovered its ability to change and to influence. So the era of mass politics, activism, unionism, strikes, peaceful resistance, youth movements will continue in the region and will expand. Nonviolent activism will exist 
in the Middle East, in the Arab world, side by side with the inevitable violence and war on terror in reaction to heightened levels of repression. But that activism will continue. It will expand. And that takes us to understanding the Arab youth. Well, the Arab youth in much of the region, they are not of one kind. Definitely, there are youth who are, the majority are from underprivileged classes. And there are those among the youth who would like to immigrate. And many of them drown in the seas as they try to get to other countries. But also, this is a road that is closing. It's becoming very difficult to do that. So the Arab youth are, are pressured and are encircled in, in, in a spot in, in their region, in their part of the world. There are those who will go to the kind of uh, militant, violent action in expressing their, their dilemmas. Their, uh, they will join violent extremist groups or take part, the others, or others among them will take part in non-violent, revolutionary, or reform-oriented civil and human rights movement. So we are entering a very politicized era. There was an era in the Middle East where people have become less political. They have what they want. They're getting what they need. Uh, life is OK. The expansion of the middle class. Now they're stressed. You see, you know the signs of an era when medical doctors step, stop being medical doctors and become political activists. I mean, the last time I remember that this happened, I wasn't born then, but in the beginning, is the late after the Nakba in 1948. Many people stopped being doctors and founded major political movements. Dr. George Habash, Dr. Wadi Haddad, Dr. Ahmed Al Khatib of Kuwait, George Habash Wadi Haddad of Palestine. Many doctors changed and became activists and writers and intellectuals. Today, I'm seeing this phenomenon across the region, from Jordan all the way to Kuwait. I mean, a few days ago, uh, a young man came. I mean, he wanted to do some. I mean, he invited me to give a, a lecture and came and a Kuwaiti young man. And as I spoke with him, he he was doing photography and, organi and organizing an entire event on Yemen, the Yemen war. He's against the Yemen war, so he wanted me to be a speaker in his event. And then I said, we sat, we had tea, and so we talked. He's a medical doctor. I said, aha, what gets you in that, you know? That's a sign of a time, that even a medic, so you get people now kind of recruited to activism and politics and reading. I, I go to the club to exercise, and I see a young man, a medical doctor. You know what he was reading? And I was shocked. I mean, I did that when I was 16. I did that 100 years ago. <laughs> but he was reading the Communist Manifesto. I said, what? <laughs> How do you get that? You know, I mean, wow, I thought that was over. He was reading. I said, no. He said, I read everything. I've read The Capital. Oh, I've read this. I've read anti Dohring. I've read uh, Lenin. I said, wow, what, what, what do you, you know? And we started talking. Medical doctor at Kuwait University. So there is, uh, uh, things are taking place in that uh, context. So, so in a way, youth are not going back home in the region. They're between extremism or nonviolent reform, democratic change that will recognize their needs and make them feel the respect that they can influence one way or another, their political system and that their political system can be accountable to them, and that they can criticize and speak their mind freely, like so many people in the world can do. And they see that today on YouTube. They see that in the internet. They see that on Twitter. They see that on Facebook. Why not them? Why should they accept that less? And that's, that's a, a, a trend. That's a phenomenon uh, in, in, in the Arab world. So the old paradigm that we're going to give you, uh, we'll give you security. But you give up all your rights, no politics, no discussion, no writing. But we give you security, and 
you should be happy and praise us day and night for doing that, and that is falling apart in the Arab world. Because people realize that they wake up one day and there is neither security nor rice and nothing because somebody was giving them a, 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 a the wrong uh, impression about how things are. They will discover one day that they have lost everything. They want to be involved in order to control their destiny. Therefore, the slogan that the people are the source of power, that the people are the source of politics, that the people are the source of the legitimacy of the political system is not just a cliche in the region. It is by the day gaining momentum, gaining support, and gaining respect by larger groups of the population, particularly particularly those under the age of 30. They, they're more open to so many things and uh, uh, new ideas. So the Arab explosion of 2011 has become a long war of attrition without borders. So Arab revolutions were not like the Six Day War or the Lebanese Civil War which was in one country, only in Lebanon. It's all over the region, but many different shapes, sizes, expressions, and forms. So my assumption is that jihadi terrorism will only retreat when we project a kind of a dialogue, an actual process that will invite people to real change to a real uh, series of processes that can lead them to the sense of a better life and something that can make them control their destiny. Today, the Arab world has one important successful example that came as a result of the 2011 revolution, which is Tunisia. They've had that rotation of power, Muslim brothers, controlled the system through election, but then they were voted out of the system through election, and that there is a beginning of a potential, despite all the socioeconomic problems that Tunisia uh, uh, faces uh, today. So a grand deal in the Arab world is needed if elites can, can seek, can open up, can bring about a, a, a willingness to talk, to genuinely have a, a, a deep dialogue with all the components of society and, and be honest about that transition to a democratic reality. We've seen that in Latin America. And when they did that, all those who carried arms gave up the arms and came. And those who didn't were fought by the state. They created a new consensus. We are not there yet. But without this, I don't see change. I see the deepening of the struggles and the deepening of the stress and the deepening of the challenges. So in the absence of reform and change and the survivability of dictatorship, the next Arab revolutionary wave will happen. If it does, if it does, my assumption, it will be much more radical than what we saw in 2011. And it will have a different thinking and a different approach, and it will be much more radical and much more clear about its objectives. And it will not let the counter-revolution rob the revolution. So I hope we don't get that. Because from studying revolutions, when they are deep and radicalized, it's not going to end up in a democracy. Iran is an example. It will end up with an Iranian type. We may end up with an Iranian type situation, regime, in Cairo, for instance. But to avoid that, we really need to go through a process that allows a compromise situation that can lift the entire system, give it a new look, but a new depth, and incorporate social groups, social movements, political groups that have not been incorporated release everybody in jail, have a pardon for all, uh, talk with those who are in jail into the system again, 
allow the formation of political parties, uh, allow for the freedom of the press and the media, open up the space of dialogue, and open up the space of change, and, and end the economic monopoly of which a lot of corruption goes through it. If that is done, then we can see different elements into the entire uh, picture. Well, my final almost note will be that all attempts to return to authoritarianism will only contribute to deeper conflict in the region. That's not going to happen. It will only create conflict. People will not take authoritarianism again in the context we have seen so far. So the warning of 2011 is a sign of an end of a way. It is, it is an end of a way. It is an end of a method. It is an end of a political style. And it is the start of a long process toward a new style, new method, new governance in the Arab world. I, I have my wishes, but I think it will be discovered as the process uncovers itself and as the people get involved in that process. Thank you very much. So uh, the difference between Tunisia and uh, uh, the rest is that uh, in Tunisia, uh, the, the revolution of 2011 succeeded in making important changes to the political system. Uh, the president left, much of his entourage left with him. Uh, a, a new group came, and uh, it, it invited everybody for a national election. So they've had national elections, but before that, they worked on a constitution, so they worked on a constitution. In this constitution, there are certain aspects that are not there in many of the constitutions of the Arab world, regarding, this, uh, regarding uh, the, the civil state, regarding the role of religion, regarding uh, uh, women's rights, regarding, uh, there's several important things that happened, but that constitution is important, much more important than any constitution written by a single leader. Like, okay, for Kepa wrote, wrote some constitution, or, or Zayla Abidin, or who, but that, it will be in the mind of them. So if there is a compromise, it says about state and religion, a sense of some separation, or if it talks about a civil state, it's different than when you have Islamists sitting with the liberals, sitting with the nationalists, sitting together as major groups with, with bases in society, with grassroots action, and making such a document. That has much more weight than a document written by a leader whose society has no relation to it. So Tunisia here is different. Not only that, but they ended up having elections. And as a result of the elections, the Muslim brothers came to power. And it was the, the uh, Ghanoushi uh, uh, party who came to power, but they were more uh, open-minded. Yet, society didn't like some of their uh, practices. And uh, probably, I would say also, they are not experienced, in a sense. I mean, when did anybody in the Arab world, besides the leader and the ruler, the single ruler and leader, have an experience in governance? Nobody is allowed to have an experience. I mean, if I want to give an example, it's like we have a college, but nobody is allowed to learn. That's the Arab. You cannot experience politics because anything is a threat. You know, anything interferes. You don't want to be in trouble. And if you go to politics, your parents will be afraid for you. 
You could lose your tongue, you could lose your life, you could lose anything. But now it's changing because there is a generation that wants to leave a mark. And it all started in Tunisia. So, Tunisia, they were able to get the Muslim brothers outside the region, outside of the government, outside of the political system. And they brought parts of the old regime for, and which tells you people can be very pragmatic in order to get, though it's a very old leader in his 80s or 90s, but he is at least providing this bureaucracy, this continuity. And so far, that's where it is. But there are so many issues. So for things to work, we need to see several rounds of election, change of leadership, new formations, and there's a lot going on in Tunisia in this sense. Now you've asked about the funding, you see, they say the Arab world is not united. We are united in a way. <laughs> we interfere in each other, left and right. So yes, we are united in this sense. So those who say, well, I'm alone and I don't care about the others, that's not true. The leaders, they care too much about each other. And if I, I would say, if I go to, to Karl Marx, uh, uh, which I learned a lot about Karl Marx here in Georgetown when I was a student. <laughs> I, I, I took a nice class, Marxism and Leninism. And I was on the left, so I said, wow, I mean, this is great. I mean, it's very, uh, very open, right? So uh, Karl Marx said, you know, the capitalists are united. Let the workers unite to make the change. They already know their interests. So yes, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, even if we read the New York Times, the Washington Post, and all of that, they played into what happened in Egypt as Mursi was deposed and Sisi put in power. Uh, um, it's, uh, there are attempts to affect Tunisia, but Tunisia has held better. So in a way, uh, we would have been luckier in the Arab world if we've had one major state that was a democratic state. And when any democracy is born, it funds it, it helps it, it, it provides support. In our situation, when one democracy emerges, all others unite to end it. I mean, even Africa does better on this. In Africa, when there is a coup, all the Africans meet and they boycott the coup until it ends and it agrees to a political process at the grassroots level by which new elections take place. Because they have experience, they, they, they know the price of a coup and what price it will have on tribes and, 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 and the kind of sectarian tribal massacres that will take place and, and all these aspects. So, so they're aware of it. So the African unit, you know, in our case, no. The Arab League will meet and the others will meet and conspire against this small democracy. <laughs> now, uh, so far, I mean, Kuwait has survived a, a semi-democracy. I will not say full, a semi-democracy. But we have a space, at least. And Lebanon has a space, but there are so many other issues coming with that. Uh, Tunisia, but, so we need, I mean, it's like when the socialists said they needed a huge socialist country to spread socialism. For America was a big democratic country to spread democracy. We need a big Arab country to spread democracy as well, or to at least have in its interest the success of a democratic example. Now, I am a believer that among all the ideologies on this planet, the democratic ideology is still the only viable one for human beings. I mean, like it or not, I mean, the communist ideology was defeated in the Cold War. Uh, the fascist ideology can appeal to some people for some time, but you know what kind of disaster it will end up bringing. The Nazi ideology, you also know. The democratic ideology is a working <laughs> ideology. I know we are into an age of, of uh, technology and, and, and so many things could, could change and they could manufacture a human being, I don't know, and a robot that we have to deal with. And that there are so many aspects, but still being in the 21st century, human beings, the way we understand, Democracy continues to hold the values about power, rotation, governance, transparency, uh, but 
it's also a system, at least it's a system that can be reformed. It's a system that can change. I know that democracy many times have not done justice to the underprivileged classes. It has to be able to, to, to absorb that socialist side, that, that aspect of where, where the haves and have not, where a very small minority uh, uh, will own everything and, and the majority are helpless. We see this, this today in the West, and, and, and that is a cause for uh, uh, populism and, and, and so many uh, uh, movements as we have seen with the election of President Trump. Uh, so overall, I, I realize that the need for, for that particular uh, uh, aspect to evolve as well, because democracy has never, and liberalism did not mean the same thing over the last 100 years. It just meant many things. It keeps evolving, it's changing, adapting. Uh, uh, therefore, yes, there is always that side, but equally, the other side could evolve because it's, it's the people's needs and the population's will. So I would say another round for change in Egypt uh, uh, will be very, very strong on the independence and the integrity of Egypt. It will not allow anybody to interfere at such a level that will, will end the lifespan of a system. I see that is part of the lessons of today. but as the war is winding down and Assad is gaining more, more power, what do you see as the, as the future of the country if the government would even allow any, any power sharing? I don't think that they would. Um, and so I, I'm just curious to see your, your ideas on the uh, political solutions. So see you. Yeah. Jean? Jean Abinader. Um, just this. Uh, Rachel Kleinfeld from Carnegie just published a book called Savage Border where she points out that more people died in Brazil than in Syria. The point being that authoritarian regimes are much more a threat to the global order than radical movements which can be snuffed out. But she points to four uh, things that have to, in, in states or cities where she saw success, there are four conditions, none of which exist in the airport. One is a growing middle class, which is, we know it's retrenching all through the region. The other is an independent judiciary, ain't going to happen. The third is um, the growth of institutions as institutions as opposed to extensions of the power politically. And, and this is where the Tunisian model is important, a more neutral perspective or sense in the security services that they're not tied to an individual personality. And I'd like you to think about how those may evolve in the Arab world if they can evolve in our lifetimes. And remember, I'm older than you. <laughs> yep. We don't know. <laughs> yep. It is disputed. <laughs> but we've known each other for how long now? A long time. Yes, and they're always giving me trouble. <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> well, are you ready or do you No, no, I'm, uh, we'll move over. Uh, Shafi, I see. I feel there is a coma among our people in Palestine today, and people are really not taking initiative to do something about things to change their lives. And I go there all the time, and I see that, and I feel it. People work for the system, as you said, the government, whoever is there, employ the people, so people feel the need of waiting for their checks at the end of the month. So how do you see those dynamics you talked about taking hold among the population of the occupied, occupied people in the in Palestine. Can you, have, can you, do you want more or do you want to uh, Thank you so much for your talk. But one thing I felt that needs to be discussed that's kind of in the background of all these questions that's the incentives of the ruling elite. But in my opinion, these rulers just don't have any incentive to create some of these changes that we've discussed. I mean, the, the rulers of Egypt, I mean, Bashar al-Assad, he, he could have left Venezuela or Russia at any time, but he chose not to. He very much believed what he was doing. Yeah, the military in Egypt, they have no incentive in their mind that they should give up their control of the economy, control of the state. So even if you know some of these changes are required, 
there just doesn't seem to be an incentive by the Brewers to actually give up. And it looks to me like they're willing to almost be like the, the royal family of friends. You know, they'll stand until basically the guys come out and take them out on the guillotine and violent radicals and has to come. Mm -hmm. So I have to take one question. Well, can, can you answer yeah. those questions and then we'll go to yeah. the other? Yeah. Okay. Do you mind? Yeah. yeah. No, Sorry, let me go your way. We have two others. Okay, so. we'll do that. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll start with Syria. Uh, you see, you have a president now on a country that is in a very divided situation, millions of refugees uh, and uh, homeless and uh, several hundred thousand deaths. Uh, uh, the president of Syria does not control Syria. The Russians do, the Iranians do, and the Turks do. And he is now a player among several players. And there is the opposition, whatever remains. And there are those aspirations of the Syrian people. So let's say uh, he wants to rebuild. Where will he get all the support to rebuild? Uh, I mean, is it possible that the person who has destroyed the country is going to rebuild it? That's going to be face a big problem. Uh, He's going to okay, reestablish his authority, and then suddenly he sends the security and arrests a group of individuals who had a history of now in the opposition. It was a training camp for everybody uh, in the Syrian people. Will they accept that if he goes back to the old way? So in a way, he cannot go back to the old way. If he goes to the old way, he will face trouble. The best way for Syria is to create a process and by which there is an understanding when he leaves and when he does not. But there has to be a process that will deal with the aspirations of the Syrian people, what really ignited their revolution in 2011. If that doesn't happen, uh, uh, look at the, the story of Iraq. Of 2-3, the regime goes down. 2-4, 2-5, a rebellion. 2-6, I don't know what. 2-7, another rebellion. 2-8, the Americans do this and this. Then the Americans withdraw. Then after the Americans, then the Iranian influence keeps building, keep building the Maliki government, then collapse, then ISIS come, then a whole war. Now there will be a war against the Hashd al-Shabi. It's a never-ending story. So between the never-ending story and finding a way out is going to be a, quite a conflict. I don't see Syria close to getting settled in that conflict. Now, so the story that Assad has won isn't, isn't at all logical. Uh, actually, nobody has won. And it's, it's a sad end. Okay. Now, the, uh, that the leaders and the rulers and the said don't have an incentive, uh, I agree. But let me, let me give just one sign of hope, which is, there are among them, so I always say the elites, the elites, but I really mean the elites who are holding power at this given moment. But there are elites who may have some power or who are part of the elites, but not necessarily at the center of power, who have better understanding of what's going on and willing to take some risk. And, uh, and you could see a scenario by which these elites will coalesce, will work with, will create a coalition with a grassroots movement in order to create change. You could see an event that could happen by the population suddenly, but then members of the elite who have a different vision will move in. We had that scenario in 2011, but then things went in a certain direction after the coup uh, that took place. So, so uh, uh, there, there are different scenarios, I would say, to the whole uh, uh, elite question. Look at Sami Annan in Egypt. He, he said, I will compete with uh, General Assisi. He said, I will. But he was put in jail. And where is he now? He's still in jail. So he took a stand that's within the army. Yet he realized that the interest of the army is not to control the country, but to let go and to create a process and a reform and a new agreement. So there are those in the Arab elite that have views that are different, but sometimes are not expressed or may land in jail or, but the regimes are in a state of attrition as a result of the cracks within the elite and the larger questions that we discussed today. So that's the second question and the question on the middle class and the security and whether we have 
Uh, is, yes, the middle class is shrinking in the Arab world, and corruption is rising. Uh, and the, uh, the state is a security state, and business, security, uh, power, is all in one hand. So we've gotten this kind of uh, uh, situation where, where all of this is consolidated. But that itself is creating the seeds of its own troubles. And it will come from different corners of society. Uh, states run this way, will run out of funds, will run out of money, uh, will not be able to, uh, to fulfill the promises. So let's say uh, some of these, I mean, look at Sudan. That's a grassroots movement, that's a serious movement. Will it end his regime, or will it end it in three years, or two years, or something has started in Sudan? What's the impact of Sudan on Egypt? The Egyptians will take another year or two, very patient population, they take their time, they, they will wait, they will give Sisi as much as he needs, but there will be a moment of truth. When that moment of truth uh, happens, uh, when things happen, sometimes the army will decide not to side with his ruler. It may side and not side. It may try, but then it may feel this is too much. Elite issues will come in. So these scenarios are wide open in the Arab world. Now what to do after that will be a big uh, question. On Palestine, uh, it's, uh, uh, you see, the, the, the Intifada of 2000, 2001 to 2004, 5, and it was the death of Yasser Arafat, uh, was a, a, a big watershed. Palestinians paid the heaviest price imagined at that. Almost every cadre, every young leader, every activist was either thrown in jail or murdered or butchered or killed or hunted down. It, it, was, a, it was a war. It was a real war, like the 82 war between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And the Palestinians, after that, uh, uh, decided to, uh, to give themselves the, the ability to uh, recreate their condition. Uh, so all forms of resistance are there. I, I've been to Ramallah, but if you look at Ramallah, you think there is a sense of normality. You go outside of Ramallah, there is no normality with the settlement building, with the repression in the refugee camps or elsewhere in Hebron. There is resistance. So now I think people in Palestine, it's about how to resist while life continues. How to resist while you continue to be on your land, not to be evicted from your land. Uh, how to stay at the same time, how to work and at the same time uh, resist. We see a lot of that going on in Jerusalem. We see a lot of that going on in, in different corners in, in Palestine. Then there's the Gaza phenomenon. There's an entire situation with Hamas, an entire situation uh, with the Qassam brigades and, and their capabilities as well. Uh, so that's also another, so part of the resistance uh, uh, to the ongoing Israeli attempt to take more land and evict more people. And therefore, the struggle goes on. Now, will it end up in one state? Will it end up in two states? Will it end up in uh, it's apartheid. So basically what I see in Palestine, an ongoing resistance to an existing apartheid in so many different ways. Some by just staying in your house and, and resisting and making sure that this house does not go. And sometimes it's by young people throwing rocks on the Israeli checkpoint. And some other times it's by uh, uh, renovating old houses and trying to create a movement to live in them. And, and others, it's by building certain institutions, such as universities and uh, schools, and etc. that continue. And so how do you live and survive and struggle under an apartheid system, under a system of segregation when there is a huge wall that really suffocates your life on a daily basis, where you can't move from one place to the other. It takes hours to move. So, so people keep resisting and discovering ways until there is a time where they see that if they throw all their lot, all their capabilities, there will be a result. I think the population of Palestine has become one of the most pragmatic pragmatic and experienced population in the Arab world. It will not rebel if it doesn't see a result. 
It will resist. If it realizes, the resistance will get incremental changes. But it's not going to throw all its power because Palestinians have done that many times in history. 36, 38, 39, they threw all their power. When 48 came, they were not ready. The uh, 2000, 2005, they threw all their lot in the uh, fight uh, to, to make sure that the results in a Palestinian state, they lost. Uh, uh, so, so now I think they, they, will, they will kind of coexist and fight. And, 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 and once in a while, there is a militant operation. But most of the times, there isn't. There is civil resistance. And they're becoming experienced. But if, if something more, may, I, I see at one point that you need to talk to those on the other side who understand you as well and create. Because I, I, I remember I was, <coughs> I was ch chairing a panel for, uh, on the transitioning from military struggle to nonviolent, uh, to, and, and how from military to nonviolent, but then from, from a, a struggle to a, a transition and a, the South, South Africa experience came and the South African who was giving a talk uh, was a leader in the South African uh, anti-apartheid movement, but I, I didn't know him. Basically, I read about him, but there was nothing to me that gave me a hint. Was he white or black? But when he was presenting and I was there, and then I looked at him and I said, you seem like a little bit Anglo-Saxon to me. I mean, he said, yes, I'm white. And I am the founder, one of the main founders of the armed wing of the South African Congress. And I said, why did you do that? He said, because there was a big massacre and it changed my life. And I joined the black population in the struggle against apartheid. And as we transition, as white, all the generals of the South African accept the white ones, accept him as someone who could understand them as the other. He became deputy minister of defense in the new regime and became a head of intelligence because he could talk to both. But he is the founder, one of the founders of the military wing. So what I, I see at the end of the day, it's a struggle about dignity, struggle in Palestine about human beings, struggle about land, struggle about uh, human rights, struggle about fulfillment of, uh, of, uh, of a democratic uh, life that people aspire to in Palestine as well. And I think that's a building institution that can provide you what you need as a national group, but also what you need as individuals. That struggle in Palestine continues full speed, given the condition today of the Arab world. And is a graduate student here, but we met in Kuwait when she was in the American University of Kuwait. She always uh, asks questions and <laughs> now doing well here. So we have a, quite a group of MA and PhD students from Kuwait. I'm happy to see you all. But among them is my son, Yazan, who's doing his MBA uh, here uh, and for the first time listening to my lectures. I, because he's a Georgetown student, at least I was able to get him to listen to my lectures. Uh, uh, so uh, thanks, Georgetown, uh, and some amazing friends. Uh, uh, so these two questions are interrelated. Uh, now, I think 
the youth of the region, uh, if we really do a statistic, really, if we have elections in the Arab world, uh, Israel will lose. I mean, Zionism is on the losing end. Because with, with, if you look at Tahrir Square in 2011, Palestinian slogans were everywhere. If you look at the Arab uprising of 2011, there was a lot of Palestinian slogans all over. The sense of justice is one everywhere. It's like there was this whole talk about recently Martin Luther King. He was fighting for civil rights for African Americans in the US, but he also stood against the war in Vietnam. And, and some of his comrades said, no, no, don't touch this. We lose a lot of people because that's not the time. He said, no, we cannot separate justice. And Arab youth are very much, in, I teach the Arab-Israeli conflict in my classroom. And because if you look at the Arab youth, look at the components. If you are if you're from the uh, Islamic bloc, you're the pro-Palestinian, and you have an Islamic vision. If you are from the Islamic Shiri bloc, you also have another Islamic vision that contradicts Zionism. If you are an Arab nationalist, automatically you are um, uh, looking at justice in Palestine as much as from an Arab point of view. Uh, it it's kind of affects the entire populations. Now, some states in the region for, uh, I mean, the way things happened just uh, recently, in the last two or three years, is this evolution of the relation between some of the Gulf countries and the White House. Not even Congress, not even American public opinion, not even uh, the universities, just the White House. And, and that, uh, with this came so many issues. Uh, I mean, there was the Yemen war. It's a war of attrition. It's a disaster war. It's a war that has to end. But with that came the Qatar blockade. That's another disaster. We thought we were doing the GCC and uniting once and for all. And then suddenly the blockade takes place and fractures the GCC. It's not logical. It's not helpful for the evolution of the system. Qatar went its way. Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates went their way and they had their own confirmation. <coughs> now, the entire paradigm that Iran is more of a threat relative to Zionism and Israel is a paradigm in the heads of very few individuals in the Middle East. It's like, uh, it's like some of the paradigms that the Shah of Iran held, but didn't have the time to hold them for long. <laughs> About everything. Uh, these, these, this thinking doesn't have any grassroots meaning. Now, if you are a, a, a Saudi and you express support to the Palestinians publicly and strongly and you say you are against certain policies, you know what your uh, end result will be the second day or the same day. If you are a Saudi supporting the policies of the government, you will be uh, in, in, in a safe, uh, uh, your position is safe. So, there's no freedom. I mean, give me freedom and I will tell you where the population. To really get a good sample, I think we can take it in Kuwait. Kuwait has a good sample. In the UAE or in Saudi Arabia, you don't have a good sample. Uh, uh, in Kuwait, because you are free to be pro and to be anti, to be with the Palestinians and to be against the Palestinians. In Kuwait, you are free to be with Hamas or against Hamas, to criticize it or not to, to hate it. You are, therefore, if you ask any Kuwaiti, he will tell you his opinion clearly, and he does not expect that the second day he will be expelled from the university, put in jail, destroyed, his family will be interrogated. But in some countries in the region, because of policy, yes, I mean, look at the Qatar situation. If you announce you are sympathizing with Qatar in some of the Gulf states, not Kuwait, not Oman, they're remaining to. Or three. <laughs> so we, we get through the censorship. The remaining three. Yeah. Not Kuwait, not Oman, <laughs> definitely not Qatar. The remaining three. So what happens to you? You get a jail sentence of 15 years. Only sympathy. It's called the, the law of sympathy. The law of sympathy. Very creative. And you're fined. You, 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 you will pay a fine in the hundreds of thousands. So 
I sympathize. I have many friends who are from the Emirates, and I know where they stand. They will not put out a word. You really know what the grassroots thinks, but they will not put. Why should they? Why should they jeopardize their lives? So it's very misleading. I mean, Ceausescu thought the demonstration in front of him was pro Ceausescu. <laughs> That's what these sympathy laws do. They mislead the leader regarding the truth and regarding what's going on. So again, I, I would say that on the other hand, this paradigm that we need to go into a struggle with Iran, why? I mean, we've had an eight-year war with Iran called the first Gulf War. It was a disaster on Iraq and on Iran. They both paid a heavy price. Why repeat that? Now, it's true, Iran has, has gotten into Iraq at big time. It's in Syria, big time. But we have to find another way because it came into Iraq big time because America came into Iraq big time. And then America left big time and left Iran big time. So I mean, we need to deal with these things. Before we go to war, I mean, ultimately we're falling into the same line. September 11th, then the, the, the reaction on Iraq, then Iran comes in, then we go. I mean, it will destroy us. We need to open a dialogue with Iran and tell Iran where we differ and try to neutralize certain zones. Uh, it's, it's in that context that I see the Iran. I mean, it's not an eternal conflict. It's not a, a conflict uh, over, over so many. We need to, un to understand the Iranian point of view. To, to some extent, the Iranians see that we have also worked against them. And therefore, they realize that the US and the West, particularly the US, is going to hit them, and the Israelis as well. At some point, they want to change their regime. So what they ended up, they manipulated so many other Arab regimes. They entered the region. In a way, we tried to isolate them. But they came through. We need to, un we need to find a way where they, you, they understand that our, our lands will not be used against them the way our lands were used to change the regime in Iraq. We need to also tell them that the military bases we have are only to protect us, but not to attack them. Can we do that? The Turks can do that, because the Turks, let's say, said no in 2003 for the uh, ability of the American forces to pass through Turkey. Can we do so? So there's such so many dynamics that we need to work out. Now, if you look really deeper, you will find that Kuwait has already opened a very interesting dialogue with Iraq and is trying to neutralize. See, Kuwait does not forget that in 1990, 1991, despite the Iraq-Iran war, and despite that Kuwait supported Iraq against Iran, that the Iranians stood neutral and were very helpful to many Kuwaitis after the invasion. So it kept that. But at the same time, Qatar today is coping with Iran. Because, see, if Saudi Arabia wanted such a big block against Iran, why encircle Qatar and force Qatar to have a dialogue with Iran? It makes no sense. A lot of policies in the region the old Arab order or the existing Arab order make no sense from a political point of view. They encircled Qatar, they made Qatar talk to Iran, made Qatar closer to Turkey, and now there is a Turkish base in Qatar. You see, totally against the objectives of what Saudi Arabia was trying to do with Qatar. They thought they would surrender in five days. It didn't happen. And today, Kuwait also is talking to Turkey in terms of security guarantees. So we have the Americans, but we also talk to the British, we have the British, and they already talk. So the Turks now are on the rise, security-wise, in the GCs, in the Gulf. Particularly Qatar, but to a lesser extent, but important. I mean, they're building our airport. So there, there, is, there is this feeling that Turkey is also, so in a way, if you wanted a block against Iran, why not have a coalition with Turkey? Why anger the Turks? Why do this kind of policies that the Turks, uh, such as what happened in the council. So the policy doesn't really meet anyone, meet anything. Uh, very, very uh, repulsive uh, as practice. The thing I see uh, from Saudi Arabia so far, in, in Yemen, in Qatar, in, uh, even with Kuwait to some extent, some issues. 
uh, in, uh, with Turkey, uh, with the opposition, with Khashoggi, uh, with the Prime Minister of Lebanon. Wow, that's very, very huge. I mean, we're always looking for the young leadership, but uh, not to that extent. <laughs>